Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. I am Dr. Priyanka Singh, Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science, DAV PG College, Varanasi. And today, I will be discussing on the concept of human rights. This is my eighth lecture and in the first lecture, I discussed about the emergence of the concept of international relations, international relations as an academic discipline. Then I also focused on the theory of idealism, realism, liberalism, Marxism, social constructivism and feminism. I also discussed about the growth of international organization, United Nation, regional organization that is European Union and today I will focus on the concept of human rights. To begin with, what is human rights? In the contemporary politics, the politics that is going on in the world currently, the concept of human rights is a dominant discourse. It is emerging as a very important concept in today's politics because it determines the overall living condition of the whole lot of humanity because human rights is actually the rights of all the human beings, the whole lot of humanity and it has become an integral part of people's life because it is directly related to their lives. In fact, human rights are the core of everything we do or try to do. And that is the reason that human rights have become the ultimate norm of all the politics that is going on in the world. So how to define human rights? It is not easy to define human rights. If you talk about human rights from literal perspective, the phrase human rights is as I already mentioned, the right of all human beings or you can also say in other words that human rights are the rights that all human beings have simply in the virtue of being human. As we are born as human, we have certain rights and these are called the human rights. Jack Donnelly he has contributed immensely in the field of human rights and he also expresses the same view regarding human rights that human rights are literally the rights that one has simply because one is human. So the core point is that if you are human, you have got certain right. It is not available to any other living being. It is only available to humans. Then Professor Maurice Creston, he has also contributed in the field of human rights. And he defines human rights as universal moral right. Something that all the men everywhere, all the times ought to have they must have, they should have that right. Something that no one may be deprived without a great affront of justice, affront to justice. That means you can't be deprived of this right. Human right is something owing to every human being simply because he is human. So, Craston also focuses on the key point and that is human rights is 
there because you are human. Now coming to the agencies, the United Nations Office for the High Commissioner for Human Rights define human rights in the following term. As per UNHCR, human rights are those rights that are inherent to all human beings. Whatever our nationality, place of residence, sex, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, language or any other status. We all are equally entitled our human rights without discrimination. Now we have to focus on each and everything that is mentioned in this definition. First thing is that it is inherent to all human beings. We all inherent this right this irrespective of the fact that what our nationality is. You can belong to any nation, you can be a citizen of any nation, it does not matter as far as human rights is concerned. Because as per UNHCR and as this concept inherits in itself that it is universal in nature. The place of residence does not matter, the sex does not matter or your national or ethnic origin have nothing to do as far as human rights are concerned. Your race or skin color does not matter, religion does not matter, language or any other status. This thing does not matter because human rights are available to all the citizens wherever they are even to the stateless persons also. Just there should be the basic condition that you are human and that is why you can enjoy this right. Coming to the historical evaluation of human rights, how human rights evolved. So the idea of human rights is as old as human civilization itself. Since the time human beings realize that they are humans, they inherit these rights. Even before the realization of this fact that you are human, human rights was there. So it is as old as human civilization. From the time that human beings started getting civilized, the idea of human rights also came into being. So it developed with the development of consciousness among human beings that as human beings they should possess certain rights and duties. Now since then the concept of human rights is developing constantly and under various civilization it has taken different shape. So it can be said that the roots of the concept of human rights lie in early tradition and documents of many culture. But the modern notion of human rights can be delineated from enlightenment period. So it can be said that the idea of human rights evolved since the since the time of human civilization. But the modern notion of human rights that we are enjoying today is the product of enlightenment period. Now John Locke who is also known as the father of liberalism, his idea of life, liberty and property as well as the notions such as freedom of speech, natural rights, limited government, they are all the watch words of human rights that is today, the modern notion of human rights. 
So, we can say that John Locke gave us some of the basic key ideas of human rights that what human rights can actually be. Because at the time when John Locke was there, there was no accepted concept of human rights. Then Thomas Jefferson idea of rights that all men are created equal. He believes that God has created every man equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unannihilable rights. Among these are life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Your life cannot be taken by any other person. As you are born, you have certain liberty that you can enjoy and also your pursuit for happiness. These are the unalienable rights. Nobody can take away these rights from you. These are inherent rights. So, Thomas Jefferson believes that all men are created equal. They are created, their creator has given them certain rights and these are life, liberty and pursuit of happiness and hence nobody have the right to take away these rights from any other human being. And these things that is life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, equality, these are the foundational ground of present day discourse of human rights. How the concept of human rights that is present today, the foundation ground of the, uh, this present right can be traced from the thoughts of John Locke, Thomas Jefferson, etc. Now coming to the important documents that support the concept of human rights. So first is the Magna Carta, then the Petition of Rights in 1628, then of course the US Constitution, then the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizens, the US Bill of Rights. These documents are considered as the antecedents of today's human rights documents. Many of the things have been taken from these documents. So the idea of human rights came into light after the end of the Second World War. I am not saying that human rights was, the idea of human rights was not there before that. As we have already saw in the evolution of the concept of human rights that it is as old as human civilization itself. But the idea, the modern idea of human rights came after the end of the Second World War. What was the reason behind that? The first was the result, the things that happened during the Second World War. And what was that? That was the massive crime against humanity. There was crimes against peace. And this massive crime against humanity, crimes against peace, become the major factor behind the emergence of the modern notion of human rights. As I have already discussed that war is not good for anyone. War only brings devastation. So the devastation created by the Second World War impacted the whole world and that impact was in a very negative way. The horridness of the war and the after effect of the war compelled people to think that they should be more now more concerned about their protection. They have to be out 
of this kind of situation. They should ensure the fact that now in the future they don't face this kind of appalling situation. So to come out of that uncertainty because war has no certainty. So to come out of that nervous state people thought of having certain mechanism so that they can be ensured about their protection, about the protection of their family. Because every individual thinks about securing his or her future. So the security was needed because until and unless people are secure people feel secure they they can't the we can't think of the development of human civilization so the idea was to bring security bring peace make a environment for development so this led to the establishment of united nation that I have already discussed in the previous lecture. And the primary goal, the main motive of United Nation was to ensure international peace and security and prevent any kind of conflict. Because people already saw the effect of the conflict in the Second World War. So, people were getting short of resources to face any other war and people wanted to ensure their life, freedom, food, shelter and nationality because war is a direct threat to life of human beings, their freedom, their food their shelter and their nationality. It brings a direct threat to life, it creates food shortages, it curbs the freedom, it takes away their shelter and it leads to a lot of human beings without shelter. Thus, there was the need of certain principle, certain mechanism so that their freedom, their life, their security get insured. And with this International Bill of Human Rights came into being. So after the Second World War, a series of declaration and covenants began to articulate universal human rights. So after the formation of United Nations in 1945, there was the need, United Nations was having the primary goal to bring international peace and security. And for that peace and security, there was a need to ensure that people are secure. So, in 1948, countries agreed on a comprehensive list of inalienable human rights. Those who were the members of United Nations, they all debated and discussed among themselves that there is an urgent need to have certain mechanism for human rights. And in 1948, these countries agreed for a comprehensive list of inalienable human rights. Inalienable because these rights can and should not be taken away. So, in December of that year, in United Nations General Assembly, Universal Declaration of Human Rights that is known as UDHR was adopted 
and the adoption of the universal declaration of human rights was a milestone that profoundly influenced the development of international human rights law. So, this united declaration of sorry universal declaration of human rights set a milestone to act further for securing human rights. There were 30 articles in universal declaration of human rights and those 30 articles were focused on the principles and building blocks of current and future human rights conventions treaties and other legal instruments. So, they acted as a, these 30 articles acted as a reference point for the future development of any other kind of law or treaties regarding human rights. So, focusing on now the international covenants. So, in December 1966, United Nations General Assembly adopted two international treaties that further shaped human rights. Because human rights is such a broad concept that it is not possible that in a single treaty or single declaration all the things get covered. So, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that is known as ICCPR monitored by the Human Rights Committee and International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Right which was proposed to be monitored by the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights was proposed. And these two covenants is regarded as international covenants. So, the first one is focused on civil and political rights because the first thing that needed to get insured was the civil and political rights and the second was economic, social and cultural rights. And to monitor these two, it was decided that human rights committee and committee on economic, social and cultural rights will monitor these two rights. So, these two are referred to as the international covenants and universal declaration of human rights along with its 30 articles and these two covenants are known as international bill of human rights. So, they got clubbed together. Apart from that, apart from International Bill of Human Rights, International Humanitarian Law and International Human Rights Law was also proposed and these two were the complementary bodies of international law because they also share some of the same views, same aim, same objective. International humanitarian law basically is set of rules that seek for humanitarian reasons to limit the effect of armed conflict because the effect of armed conflict is not easy to measure, it cannot be measured, it is unmeasurable. It can only be felt by those who are undergoing that thing. So, international humanitarian law basically protect persons who are not or no longer participating in the hostilities and restrict the means and methods of warfare. So, international humanitarian law is also known as law of war or law of armed conflict. So, those who are not participating in that war, they are the not, they are not the part of that hostility. They need to be protected and that protection is provided by international humanitarian law. That is why it is 
called as a complementary body to an in international bill of human rights. So, international human rights law, the next one that is this one, international human rights law. What is international human rights law? It is a set of international rules established by treaty or custom based on which individuals and groups can expect or claim certain behavior or benefits from the government. Now, you can easily draw out the difference between international human, uh, international human rights law and international humanitarian law. So, international humanitarian law is what? It limit the effect of armed conflict and international human rights law is basically given to individual or group so that they can claim certain behavior and benefit from the government. So, government is not involved in international humanitarian law. Thus, international human rights law is applied at all the time during peace and war. And international humanitarian law applies only during the time of the conflict. Human rights is applied during peace as well as war and humanitarian law is applied during the time of war. Now, coming to the generations of human rights. So, as we already saw that first the need, need was filled for civil and political and then social, economic and cultural. So, the human right discourse we generally classify their generations into three categories and but now we are in the phase of fourth category also that I will discuss later on. So, the division of human rights into three generations was conceptualized in 1979 by Shays jurist Karel Vasak. Karel Vasak classified human rights into first civil political rights, second social economic rights and third collective developmental rights. And these three categories that is civil and political, social economic and collective developmental, these three categories align with the three tenets of French revolution and what was that? Liberty, equality and fraternity. So, liberty, equality and fraternity align with all these three categories. Now, coming to the first generation of human rights that is civil and political rights. So, the first generation of human rights dates back to the 20th century and it refers to traditional civil and political liberties and it is basically the offshoot of western liberal democracies because western liberal democracies basically focuses on freedom of speech, religion and press as well as freedom from torture and non-interference on the part of the government. So, this first generation of human rights which is civil and political rights which basically emphasizes upon freedom of speech, religion, freedom of press, freedom from torture and non-interference on the part of the government these are regarded as classical human rights because they are the first generation of human rights. So, the first generation of human rights is basically intended for the protection of individual against the state interference. So, there was a kind of individual needed space from the state. So, there was need to draw a boundary between the individual and the state, how much the state can interfere in and how much individual can have their liberty. And these rights as they were the first generation of human rights, they really enjoyed a very reputed position and they were a dominating force 
dominating discourse and they dominated over other forms of right for a very long time. So, the first generation of rights at the international level are contained in the international covenant on civil and political rights that I have already mentioned previously. Now, coming to the second generation of human rights that is economic, social and cultural right. So, the second generation of human rights are generally considered as those rights which required affirmative government action. Government need to be affirmative in its action, so that every individual can have their economic, social and cultural rights. So, second generation of rights is often styled as or known as group rights or collective rights. As in the first generation of human rights, individual were given the priority, in the second generation of human rights, collective or society were given the priority. So, this is you know a journey of human rights, focusing solely on an individual to the collective being. So, in contrast to the first generation of rights which are the individual entitlement, the second generation of human rights are exercised by all the people connectively. So, what were the main examples of second generation of human rights? They are the right to education, work, right to social security, right to food, right to self determination and right to adequate standard of living. So, they are not focusing on individual only, they are focusing on the society, the development of the society. So, the second generation of human rights is basically they are classified in universal declaration of human rights from article 23 to 29, which says that right to work, equal pay for equal work, right to food, right to clothing and shelter, right to educational right and to participate in cultural life and so on and so forth. So, the second generation of uh, human rights has been we can find the second generation of human rights in the international covenant on economic, social and cultural right that is a part of international covenant. Now, coming to the third generation of human rights, those are known as the collective rights. So, the third generation of human rights has been distinguished from other two rights that is civil and political and economic, social and cultural. And it is predicted not only upon both affirmative and negative duties of the state, but also upon the behavior of each individual. So, what are the things that is included in this right? Self determination, there are also uh, various other normative expressions. These include the right to development, right to peace, right to healthy environment and right to intergenerational equity. Just ensuring that individual have their liberty, have their rights, individual have the right to education, right to culture is not sufficient, is not enough. They should also be ensured about right to development and how that development will be achieved until and unless the society will be peaceful. So, the, the right to peace is also included in the third generation of human rights. These things are missing in the first and the second generation. Right to healthy environment. 
so individual have that right to be in a clean environment breathe clean air so these are the things that are included in the third generation of human rights so there are lot of normative expressions what ought to be what should be is included in the third generation of human rights and the fourth generation of human rights karl wessek didn't emphasize on this generation this is the latest development it is the most recent recognized category of human rights and this fourth generation of human rights is linked to intergenerational justice or rights of future generations this category includes rights related to genetic engineering the human genome genetic manipulation vital fertilization human embryos euthanasia these are the activities that are recently coming up and the other generation of human rights do not encompass them so there was a need for the fourth generation of human rights because human have progressed a lot from 1948 till now so there are also ethical moral and religious values that has emphasized in the fourth generation of human rights that were missing in the third gen third first and second generation of human rights however human rights is not free from criticism there has been various schools of thought that criticized human rights and it received criticism from the other part of the world now what do i mean when i say other part of the world because the concept of human rights is a western notion so the attack on the validity of the concept of human rights law has been mainly launched by the two quarters first the feminist and the cultural relativists the feminist criticized the concept of human rights on the ground that the question of gender has hardly been touched upon so under the garb of human rights which has led to the concept of women rights under the garb of human rights there was no mention of women women were missing so there was need to bring into the picture the needs of the other section of the society the other half of the section of the society now i will take you to some of the previous slides when i was talking about the concept of human rights so the definition of thomas jefferson what does he say all men where are the women so these kind of words they clearly say that women were missing in the concept of human rights human rights were only for men and feminist criticized this concept now focusing on what were the grounds on which women criticized human rights first that i all showed you male centric terminology so when there is the use of male centric terminology they clearly reflect that they neglect women representation within the declaration so within the declaration of human rights women is missing women is not there and as women are not there in the that in that declaration in those principles so feminist alleges that human rights fail to incorporate the aspiration needs and interest of women the 
what women want that aspiration what they need and what are their interest they are missing in the concept of human rights because as human rights was the product of the second world war so it was basically focused on the issues that need to get resolved that were there as the result of the world war and it is generally perceived that women has nothing to do with conflict and war so feminist allege that the violence against women is the touch stone that clearly illustrate the limited concept of human rights because the confined boundaries of human rights has kept out most of the women issues and this led to feminists from all over the world to raise a voice against this notion the other quarter which massively criticized the concept of human rights was cultural relativists now with cultural relativism comes the concept of universalism as we saw in the previous slides in the previous dis discussion that human rights claims that it is universal in nature but cultural relativism says that human rights is not universal in nature because human rights is the product of western part of the world and that is the reason that it is framed in their language reflect their need and their aspiration so it is in the language of the west addressing the needs and aspirations of the west how can it claim itself to be universal in nature cultural relativists say that they allege that human rights is the gift of the west to the rest the west is trying to impose this concept on the rest of the world so basically human rights is imposition of some particular set of religious cultural values on the other peoples of the world so cultural relativists basically claim that whatever the standard of human right is there it may vary and that is the reason that human right should not claim itself to be universal in nature and it should not get imposed upon the rest of the world because every society is different every culture is different and the need and aspiration of every country is different if it is not universal how can human rights claim itself to be universal with within the concept of human rights there is also the concept of asian values so basically in 1993 the 34 asian and middle eastern states adopted the bangkok declaration claiming that human rights must be considered in the context of a dynamic and evolving process of international norm setting bearing in mind the significance of national and regional peculiarities and various historical cultural and regional background the who were the major champions of 
the concept of Asian values. The first name that comes is Lee Kuan Yew, the first Prime Minister of Singapore. Then Go Chok Tong, the former Prime Minister of Singapore, Mahathir Mohammed, the former Prime Minister of Malaysia. So, basically, the concept of Asian values is premised upon certain pillars. Asian values claim that human rights is not universal and if they are not universal, they should not be globalized. The whole of the world has nothing to do with the universalism of human rights because every part of the world is different. They differ according to their different social status, economic status, culture and political conditions. We can say that the political condition in USA and the political condition in Nepal or for that matter in Bhutan is not the same. So, if we are different in terms of our social values, economy, cultural values and political condition, how can the concept of human rights be applied everywhere? So, the process of globalizing the concept of human rights should be stopped because the West is different and rest is different. These scholars Lee Kuan Yew, Go Chow Tong, Mahathir Muhammad, they all claim the fact that we are not the same as the West is. Our society is different, our value system is different and Asian countries is different from the West. So, their concept of human rights can't be applied as it is in the West to Asian countries because we are different from them. They claim that Asian societies are not individual centric like the West is. We give more importance to our family than ourselves. And as we give more importance to our family, this is the individual, family is more important than individual and society is more important than family and nation is more important than society. So, individual may compromise. So, the first thing that is our priority is nation, not the individual. So, they clearly reject the first generation of human rights which is basically the individual want their rights against the state. So, family values are important in Asian societies where individual is ready to compromise their own interest for the sake of the family. And if they compromise their interest for the sake of the family, they can also compromise their interest for the sake of the nation. So, Asian societies rank social and economic rights over individual political rights. Also, the right of a nation to self-determination includes a government's domestic jurisdiction over human rights. 
So, what does this imply? It implies that other nations should not interfere with the internal affairs of the state, including its human rights policy. So, the other nation or the West cannot teach the Asian societies that how they should apply human rights on their citizens. The Asian societies do not need lesson from West, but there has been loopholes in the concept of Asian values also. Because the proponents of the Asian values basically use confusion argument, but under the garb of this argument there is a hidden agenda and that hidden agenda is that they want to basically justify their authoritarian position. Although these scholars who are also the leaders of their nation, they claim that authoritarianism is needed for the development of their country, but in doing so they are to, to a very large extent harming the interest of their citizens. So, the critics of the concept of Asian values say that dictatorship is not a sufficient condition for development. And as they are claiming that Asian values is different from western values, so it can also be claimed that within Asian values also there are diversity. Asian values are not universal they are also diverse. The system of China is different, the system of India is different, the system of Pakistan is different. So, China, India and Pakistan they cannot be said that they have universal values. So, if human rights is not universal, Asian values is also not universal because Asian values is also a very diverse concept. Amartya Sen also claim that the so called Asian values cannot operate because of overriding cultural diversity found in Asia. There is lot of cultural diversity in Asia. So, the application of the concept of Asian values is also not universal and the diversity between the human rights and its universal character and Asian values reached to a compromising point in the Vienna declaration 1993. The section 5 and part 1 of the Vienna declaration states that all human rights are in universal indivisible, interdependent and interrelated. So, the international community must treat human rights globally in a fair and equal manner, on the same footing and with the same emphasis. So, while the significance of national and regional particularities and various historical, cultural and religious backgrounds must be borne in mind, it is the duty of the states regardless of their political, economic and cultural system to promote and protect human rights. So, as far as the promotion and protection of human rights is concerned, it is the duty of the state that they should rise above their political, economic and cultural system and give first priority to the rights of their citizens. Now, the implication of human rights for the global politics. First, the responsibility of the government. 
सो ह्यूमन राइट बेसिकली इन्वेस्ट गवर्नमेंट विथ पावरफुल ऑब्लिगेशन एफेक्टिंग देयर फॉरन एज वेल एज डोमेस्टिक पॉलिसीज सो द प्रोटेक्शन एंड रियलाइजेशन ऑफ ह्यूमन राइट इज दस द कोर पर्पज ऑफ गवर्नमेंट सो इंटरक्शन बिटवीन स्टेट्स शुड देयर फोर हैव एटलीस्ट ह्यूमन राइट डायमेंशन सो फर्स्ट इज द रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी ऑफ द गवर्नमेंट then human right goes beyond national boundaries the boundaries of moral concern extend beyond national borders so human rights are nothing less than the demand of all humanity on all of humanity so the doctrine of human rights therefore goes hand in hand with the growth of cosmopolitan sensibilities and what is that cosmopolitan sensi- sensibility that human rights fulfill each of the three elements of cosmopolitanism individualism universality and generality human rights have certain challenges because there is a relief for the victim of the gross violation of human rights is concerned there is challenge of protection the challenge of prevention the challenge of poverty the challenge of promoting and protecting the rights of children justice and empowerment for women the challenge of democracy and rule of law the challenge of national protection system in each country these challenges are faced by human rights new threats are emerging day by day such as terrorism biotechnology the challenges of people on the move challenges of inequality all where inequality is there the challenges of faced by groups at risk and the challenges of of holding human rights norm in a world in convulsion these are the challenges that is faced by human rights but the credit goes to human rights that at least there is some convention there is some covenant that a person in grief can refer to when and where he or she needs it thank you